Welcome back to Tetracan Super Monoblock. Today's video is about the specifics of doing calibration on a Tascam 44 Mark II. I've already done a couple of videos about calibrating Porter Studios. One was demonstrated on a 44 Mark III, and I also have demonstrated it on a Tascam 244. I'm just gonna talk a little bit about the logistics of doing it on this particular unit. First things first, safety. Because this has got an internal transformer, got it propped up just with bits of cardboard. Before I've started, I've actually put a bit of blue tack over the pins of the live and neutral wire coming into this. So if I do have a brain fart and just put my hand there, then I'm less likely to get a potentially fatal electric shock. If you're really feeling paranoid about that, you could put on rubberized uh, gloves. Um, you know, you can get that kind of thing off eBay, Amazon, AliExpress, wherever, so that if you did accidentally touch something live, you'd be saved from an electric shock. But generally speaking, as long as you don't touch anything here, you know, this is all safe to touch. The way to do this is to have the front of the unit tipped up. You can see I've disconnected the cable that would go into the power board here from the mixer and um, there's an earth connection here. I mean if this mixer was receiving power you would hear there's quite a lot of buzz in your headphone output for instance but for the purposes of calibration it doesn't make any difference. Although I've gone into quite a lot of detail about how to calibrate the meters on 244 because they're analog and that is an important first step. I haven't found any problems with these digital meters that are built into the 464, 424, Mark II and 424 Mark III. They can be dependent on so in a lot of ways you can actually just use them to measure playback and recording signals directly without using an oscilloscope. I do have an oscilloscope connected. I'm about to upgrade, I'm, I'm waiting for the unit to arrive but I'm, I'm getting one that's got the oscilloscope and the capacitance meter and the digital multimeter all in one handheld unit. Just because it's more convenient for me to have one thing running off batteries rather than having to have this separate unit with the power. So I mean I'll include a link to the one that I'm getting but this one is cheaper, probably more accurate in terms of the level of the signal that I'm getting off tape than this meter. And it's also functioning as a frequency counter so I can adjust the playback pitch so I'm getting exactly the right frequency so that if you've got this uh, pitch control here in 12 o'clock then that should be in high speed mode exactly three and three quarters inches per second. In other videos I've demonstrated using a kind of um, Chinese DIY frequency counter, I was beginning to find I had problems with that. I tried to make I made some um, reference tapes and uh, the shit totally hit the fan and only a tool blames his tools but I'm pretty sure it was the meter that was throwing me off. Um, I'm getting some really funny readings of it so I've just stuck that in the bin and I'm now relying on this. The readings that I'm getting are much more closely correspond to the pitch that my test tapes are playing back at. So, you know, For instance that's 400 hertz. Let's, let's hit play here. So that, yeah, sorry, this one's meant to be 800 hertz at high speed and you can see it's just fluttering 801, 802 hertz, which is about what you'd expect. You're not going to have it absolutely bang on when you've only got a tiny little trim pot. And then uh, inside here, this top board this is attached with two screws. I've got that just hanging loose so that I can access these trim pots, which correspond to the high speed and low speed of the tape recorder. And then I'm adjusting that with a ceramic tip screwdriver. And then EQ, I tend to leave alone unless it sounds awful. I don't tend to touch the DBX timing switches because there's not all that much information about it. And I know that I'm basically changing the timing of the compander, but unless it sounds really bad, like there's a really obvious problem with squashing and pumping coming from the, the use of DBX system, I tend to leave that alone. So really the only ones that I would adjust apart from the speed of the tape are record and playback trim pots. You do the playback first and then what you're aiming for is to get the recorded level to come back showing up in the meters at the same levels. Because basically you're wanting to get the best out of the system in terms of the noise floor but you're also wanting the meters to be as useful as possible for the user so that if you're recording and you know the meters flashing up here on the way in then it's also flashing at that level on playback rather than it's much louder or much quieter than what you thought you recorded. So these trim pots are pretty well labelled, um, like you can see that's labelled record and playback and then you can sort of see that diagonal 
constellation repeating itself over the channels track 4, track 3, track 2, track 1. They're slightly different for ergonomic reasons here in track 1, but you know that's still labelled PB for playback and REC for record. So if I... I know that this tape, this commercially produced tape, is very loud. So, I mean, they're all at like plus three decibels, but as long as they're solidly lit and at the same height, then I'm okay with that. So yeah, that's it. I've probably glossed over some aspects of the process just because I know I've done more detailed videos on this topic before. So I'll put links to them and um, I'll throw in some links as well to some of the equipment that I'm using, both what I am using and what I am going to be getting, which is, I think, probably a better solution. If you've got any questions, ideally put them in the YouTube comments. Public helps more people, but, you know, if you're feeling shy, you can get in contact with me via Facebook. And um, I hope to see you again soon.